It's a real pleasure to be here in, uh, in Colorado. I got to go uh, cross country skiing in the back country yesterday, 70 inch snow base, and I was skiing in the trees yesterday. It was really impressive. <laughs> and I'll talk a little, about, a little bit about the local weather here in just a second. First, I want to uh, acknowledge, uh, although I'm the speaker, I want to acknowledge my past students uh, who were in the chases the last few years. Uh, Jeff Snyder, who's a postdoc now at NSSL, Jana Hauser, who's now on the faculty at Ohio University, and Vivek Mahale, who is still at OU working on his thesis, and Kyle Peen and uh, Zach Weinroff, who are both my new graduate students. And this is not working. Uh, this is a plot from uh, NCAR, the Mesa Lab in Boulder. We had an exciting uh, uh, 12 hours, uh, really. Uh, if you look in the uh, upper corner, you see the temperature shot up last night uh, from the 30s up into the mid-50s. And actually, this morning, uh, peaked out uh, in the upper 50s. Uh, at about the time that the wind picked up, uh, the wind gusted to about 87 miles per hour. And where I was, it was really rocking and rolling. Very, very difficult to sleep last night. And just about this time, I decided to go out for a run on the trail behind our place. And I went out with just a sweater. It was quite warm. And there you go. Uh, the temperature changed. Uh, in less than a, probably about five or 10 seconds, the temperature dropped. Uh, over 20 degrees, down to 32. And I was not a very happy camper. He used to say my speed of my run picked up. I'm going to dedicate my talk today to uh, Tim. It's a picture of Tim I took a few years ago, right here. Uh, and for Tim, one of the reasons why we chase, uh, I consider myself to be an academic, at least that's how they pay me. But I love to storm chase. Here's one of the reasons why I storm chase. Look at Wordsworth's definition of poetry, spontaneous overflow of feelings, aroused by our unmediated encounter with nature. That's something which I think I share with a lot of you uh, out there. Uh, some of the, a few topics that I'm going to try to cover in the short hour that I have, uh, I'm going to talk about the wind speed estimates in tornadoes using mobile Doppler radars, some issues related to, the, to their relationships to storm damage, and esti wind estimates and theoretical considerations. I'm not going to do very much in the theoretical considerations. Uh, evolution of vortices and supercells in tornado genesis, some structure of cyclonic, anti-cyclonic coupled vortices and anti-cyclonic tornadoes, which we've seen several in just the last few years. Uh, and I'll every once in a while touch on storm uh, chasing safety, but I'll leave most of it to, to Chuck. Uh, the scientific objectives of our NSF-funded field experiments are to study uh, tornado genesis and determine tornado structure, including wind speeds near the ground, using our mobile Doppler radar. The general strategies, the general strategies for scanning uh, are put up there. I'm not going to go through them all in detail. But we'll scan in different ways depending upon how far away the storm is, whether or not there's a tornado, and so on. But a few considerations that are very important, a couple of trade-offs we have. Uh, one is that there's a trade-off between the depth of the volume scan and the update time. Ideally, you'd like to scan the entire storm and the tornado. Uh, the longer, the deeper the volume, the longer it takes to execute that scan. Uh, Range resolution and sensitivity. Do you like to get the smallest range resolution that you... I'd like to hear the audience panting. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> um, there's a trade-off between range resolution and sensitivity. You'd like to get the, the, the shortest pulses to get the highest range resolution. But when you do that, uh, you sacrifice sensitivity. So you need to get as close as you can to the tornado and be safe uh, to get the very, very high resolution. Uh, the radar that we use is called RAXPOL, or Rapid X Pol. I talked about it, I think, a few years ago when I was here. Uh, it's, whoops. Uh, the paper's been published. It's in JTEC. 
You could look if you want to see all the gory details about the engineering that goes into this radar. The radar scans 180 degrees a second, which is a lot faster than most mechanically scanning radars. Uh, the number of pulses, uh, pulse pairs that are used to estimate the Doppler moments is 12. I'm telling you this because this is an important design consideration. Usually we get good estimates of the Doppler uh, uh, spectrum, the Doppler winds, uh, the reflectivity, and so on, uh, if we have at least 10 samples. Uh, we use frequency hopping to get as many independent samples as we can. So the radar really is like 10 radars at once. Uh, we change frequency. We, run, we send out pulses and step the frequency up. And each time we step the frequency up, we change the frequency by enough that each sample is considered to be an independent sample. So it's like having 10 radars out there, or whatever. Um, I'm not going to tell you about the bandwidth of the anti-aliasing filter, but there's a limit to how good range resolution can be. And we do the best that we can. Um, the cases that we've collected in the last two years, 2012-2013, uh, uh, of tornado genesis or near tornado genesis, uh, you can see up at top, uh, a number in 2012 and a number in 2013. Uh, I ha would have to say that 2012 and 2013 for our group is probably the best we've ever, ever had. I don't think it gets any better than this. Uh, but I'm going to concentrate first on the uh, 31 May storm from last year, the El Reno storm, uh, because not only because of its no notoriety, but because of the uh, interesting data set that we collected. And then I'm going to talk to you about some of the other storms. And then at the very end, I'm going to just show a couple of videos. This is uh, Rack's poll. And if you can go ahead and animate this, it goes around very quickly. When you step outside the radar track, you have to be careful you don't get hit by the radar antenna. And I mentioned this the last time I showed this to you, but you notice the date that I took this picture, 22 May 2011, that was the Joplin day. We were not in Joplin. We were in Oklahoma. Whoops. Okay, these are some pictures of, uh, uh, of our chase that day. Uh, in the top left, you see the first towers going up in El Reno. I think many of you may have been there. There were hundreds of people stopped at several convenience stores on I-40. And then the tower to the right is one that I took, a uh, picture I took looking to the west. Uh, of, the, of the first storms going up. And then the picture at the bottom is a panoramic picture I took uh, showing the uh, radar on the right. And these are the storms as they're getting organized. That's north, that's south. And we were looking to the southwest, to the southwesternmost storm. And at this point, the question was, is the storm going to come right into El Reno? Should we stay north of El Reno or go south of El Reno? This is the damage path of the uh, El Reno tornado, which seen many times before and you will see many times again. Um, our first deployment site was north of El Reno looking to the southwest and then we moved south and our second deployment spot uh, southwest of El Reno uh, was began at 2246 and the tornado began at 2303 so it took about five minutes to get the radar up and running so we have the entire genesis of the tornado and we collect the data till 2315. There's the position of the tornado at 2315. And you can see that I got suitably nervous. And there was quite a debate uh, as to whether we should go south or whether we should go east. And I in no way wanted to go south because I didn't want to have the, the chance that the tornado could overrun us, number one. And number two, I was familiar with the roads in this area. And I knew that because of the Canadian River that our options would be rather limited. So I made the decision at this point to head up to I-40, and I thought that the tornado was moving to the southeast. So I told my students, look, uh, forget about getting photography. We need to collect data. Let's just go east. We won't get to see the tornado, but we'll be able to collect really good data. So we left this deployment spot at 2315, went north and east of I-40. I rejected taking any of the, the, uh, the country roads. And uh, I'll show you in a minute. At that point, I realized that uh, 
uh, something strange was happening. We stopped at this point. We, we collected data continuously while the radar was moving and then put down stakes at 20, 22, uh, 23, 24, at which time the tornado was uh, right near the intersection of Reuter Road and Radio Road. It's actually a little bit to the southwest. You notice that it was at that time that the tornado took a sharp turn to the right. And I think this is where the problems may have occurred. Uh, some other people know more about this than I do. But we continued to collect data uh, until 22, 23, 27. Whoops. Sorry. I'll get this right before the hour's over. This is like patting your head and rubbing your stomach. <laughs> and uh, as we went east on uh, I-40, I did get a little bit scared because debris was falling from the sky. Now when I say debris, I don't mean cows and big chunks of wood. I mean leaves and, and uh, small twigs. And I told my driver, please drive carefully, but as quickly as you can, to the east. We had I-40 all to ourselves because the tornado was crossing I-40. No one could get on I-40, so it was a chaser's dream in terms of being on I-40. You could drive and stop anywhere you wanted to and weren't impeded at all in travel. We set up at another point to the southeast, and then we kept uh, moving to the east until we encountered the traffic jam in Oklahoma City, which is another story which I'll get to in just a little bit. <coughs> Let me just show you quickly some frame grabs for my cell phone. Uh, this is our first deployment spot, and you can see we're looking to the southwest at these multi-cells. That's at uh, 530, 535. 5.49, uh, we had set up our, our uh, deployment spot southwest of El Reno, looking to the west. That's a very, very nice location to be. Uh, at uh, 6.15, when we decided to move, there was a tornado just to our southwest. And at this point, my feeling was we'll go east in I-40, the tornado will move off to the southeast, and we'll collect data north of the tornado. Then I noticed, what's going on? Uh, I noticed that there was a tornado vortex signature right on I-40. There's the dump of velocities. There's the uh, reflectivity. And not knowing what had happened in real time, I had guessed that there was cyclical tornado genesis. And my guess was a second tornado, the first tornado may have dissipated and another one had formed. I didn't realize that the tornado had completely changed directions at that point. Then we moved on to our next deployment spot, looking to the south, to the west-southwest. There's the main tornado, still on I-40, and there's the anticyclonic anti tornado, which we collected data in. Okay, <clears throat> there's the uh, tornado, is it, uh, tornado. There's the storm as it appeared uh, during our first deployment, before the tornado uh, actually uh, formed. And there we are at 2304, there's the tornado forming. And there are 2305, there are the chasers going to the south, and there's the tornado getting closer to us. And at this point, my feeling was the tornado is moving to the southeast, and as long as we keep the tornado more than four kilometers away, we're safe. Uh, my feeling is that we're using a radar that you can get within three or four kilometers. The, if the tornado is within three kilometers, you should not be there. Uh, and the reason is, many years ago, some people were talking to me about this earlier today, during the Red Rock tornado in Oklahoma on April 26, 1991, we collected uh, mobile do portable Doppler radar data from a tornado, an EF-5 tornado. The tornado was just a few miles away, and I decided after the fact to drive down the road to see where the damage was. And we barely got very far. We were two miles from the tornado, and we found a telephone pole lying in the middle of the road. And that said to me, you don't want to be close. And then in 2309, this is a wide-angle shot showing the tail cloud and the tornado off to the left. Again, we're looking to the west, so my feeling was the tornado was going to the southeast. Whoops. <sighs> at 2314, we began to get a little bit worried because we could see, and I know that Greg showed the video frames from this uh, earlier this, this morning, but they're... I'm getting too excited here. There you can see the multiple vortices just to our southwest. 
And at this point, we decided it's best to start moving to the east. That's what it looked like inside the tornado. <laughs> now, uh, this is an animation. Before you start it, it's from 2250 to 2314. And uh, I'm going to show you the entire genesis of the tornado up to the mature stage when we had to uh, get out of the way. So if you can animate this, there it goes. There you see it. You see it's changing direction. Now it's moving to the northeast. At that point, when we did that, would you please, if you could play that again, I want to try to point out a few things. Okay, could you start again one more time? Look at when it forms. Do you see? Well, I wasn't fast enough. Show that one more time. You're going to see uh, precip, precip material moving very rapidly westward just as the tornado is about to form. Okay, well, we have volumetric data. I think we, uh, at this point, we're either going up to, I think we're going up to 20 degrees elevation angle. So we have a pretty good data set. Uh, each volume uh, is separated in time by about 15 seconds. So every 15 seconds, we have a whole uh, volume. And with this radar, we don't scan a sector, we scan a full 360 degrees. So you get the entire storm and everything else that's going on. It's very, very nice. Next slide. I can do that. <laughs> Uh, let me just show you some of the other interesting things that we see. This is from 2301, just before the uh, tornado formed. This is an 18 degree elevation angle scan, and this is the updraft region in here. But look at all the evidence of gravity waves, all those linear structures uh, uh, at, at uh, mid levels of the storm, low and mid levels of the storm. Which, again, something else we're going to look at. We're going to look at the speed uh, and wavelength and see uh, whether or not we can make sense of these gravity waves. Um, one of the things that we saw at uh, 2315, almost 2316, that's of note, was that here's the main tornado, and there is another second tornado, which actually formed in this region, and then wrapped around the tornado and became absorbed by the main tornado. This is ZDR, low ZDR means debris. This is rho HV, low rho HV means debris. Look how clear that debris signature is. Again, it looks, has a comma shape to it. And we have, this is, uh, D, uh, this is not, this is alias velocities, we haven't unfolded this yet, but there you see two vortex couplets associated with each, each tornado. These range markers are, I think, every, uh, every uh, two kilometers, so these uh, tornadoes are, are uh, one kilometer apart. <laughs> these are not multiple vortices, this was a, a completely separate tornado. And here you can see, i uh, break it down just a little bit, I don't know how well you can see that from the back of the room, but the tornado began here, and this is roughly 15 seconds time intervals, and you see that second eye track around to the west of the main tornado, and then come around and then become absorbed by it. Uh, this is a, an animation, if you play this animation, you might be able to catch it happening. Play it, uh, you can just see it wrap around and, and come on in. Next slide. I can do that. <laughs> okay, it's now 23, 23, 58. We've moved to our next uh, deployment spot. And the storm was, uh, I don't use the word awesome ever. I think this is one instance where the word awesome can be actually used to describe this, this storm uh, with the striated striations around the front of the base. Uh, and the tornado is back off to our southwest. And uh, here you see some pictures I took uh, from this deployment spot, and you can see the main tornado with uh, a separate satellite vortex. And uh, Roger Wakimoto and uh, Nolan Atkins were with us uh, for uh, several weeks this storm season, taking uh, uh, very well documented photographs in there. They're actually tracking the speeds of these multiple vortices and comparing them with the speeds that we're seeing on, on radar. Uh, but this picture is not good because of the, uh, the contrast isn't good on, on this projector. But there's the Y tornado. There's a, there's a second vortex where that white line is, another vortex around the back side of the uh, tornado. And if you can animate this, please. 
This is a 23 to 28 animation. Just keep on be doing it. Now, you notice the tornado, uh, it comes towards us and then moves away. That's because uh, when the tornado got close, we moved. <laughs> so we don't have any magical powers to make tornadoes back off. But you'll notice that at the beginning of this, just keep on doing it, the tornado has a well-defined small eye, and as you move away from it, you can see the multiple vortex structure. Uh, it becomes it becomes a lot wider, uh, and I'll focus in on that in just a moment. Okay, we can stop that. Go on to the next slide. This is an animation of row HV. So think of this as an animation of the debris cloud. Okay, if you could play that over and over again. And you can see the debris rotating, there are little spokes emanating from the center. And then notice how wide it gets at the very end. It gets to be about four kilometers wide. So that's the debris cloud from the tornado. Uh, we also looked at the, at the width of the 30 meter per second isodop. And that was also about close to four kilometers. So uh, this was a very wide tornado. Uh, this is a sub-vortex that we track. Now these are uh, uh, alias Doppler velocities, uh, so you'll probably have trouble making them out, but you'll have to trust me, these are the two same vortices which we track every 15 seconds, and they moved about 700 meters in 10 seconds, so that was moving about 70 meters per second. So the actual satellite vortex was moving about 70 meters per second, probably a little bit more. This is a little bit conservative, I think. So these things were traveling very quickly, and that's not, you would expect that, because the mean winds in the tornado at that range were probably even greater than 70 meters per second, and that the, the vortices should be moving actually s more slowly than the mean wind. For those of you that know about the large-scale aspects of the atmosphere, Rossby waves <laughs> retrograde, and these are like Rossby waves. So I would have been surprised to have seen that moving a lot faster than this. And this is a de uh, version of one of the pictures that we used in that sequence. And you can see that we have a wind here of 130 meters per second. Now, uh, that's 130 meters per second. That, that's within the main core of the approaching velocities. They're the core of the receding velocities. And the important point is that uh, this 130 meters per second is a measurement over a small volume for a very, very short period of time. So you would not look at this 130 meters per second and say there should be 130 meters per second at the ground at that point. The winds would have been a little bit less. Uh, this is uh, a picture of, on the left of the uh, row HV. And you can see that there were spokes, okay, the spiral bands and the debris cloud. And this is, on the right, you, you see spectrum width. So this tells us something about the spread of the Doppler velocities in our volume. And you can see that where we have the multiple vortices, there is a tremendous spread in excess of 10 meters per second, which is very, very, very large. But we also can see spiral, a spiral pattern to the um, uh, spectrum width. And that's something also that we're going to be studying. Not too many people have looked at spectrum widths very much, not in any great detail, I don't think. Okay, um, I can look at the screen and I'm heartbroken because the, the color is not reproducing. You're going to have to go over to my laptop here. Um, so let's skip this one. Now I'll have to show you the stills. What this animation shows are individual suction vortices tracking along. We can actually track them every two seconds. Uh, this, go on to the still. I can, again, I can do that. Okay, the still looks a little bit better, but um, still not perfect. But you see there's one sub-vortex A, there's a ring around a sub-vortex B, and, uh, and a ring around sub-vortex C on the left. On the right, we have Doppler velocities that are aliased and we can actually resolve the, the vortex couplet with A, the vortex couplet with V, the vortex couplet with C, and we can also see a vortex couplet D that does not seem to be associated at all with any uh, weak echo hole at all. I don't know what the reason for that is. Maybe it's just forming at that point. Remember, these seem to be forming and then rotating around. 
Um, also, we are able to identify some of these suction vortices with what they appear visually in the photographs, and that's something that Roger is going to be working with a lot. Uh, another image from the same time. Uh, look at the clover, the, the um, protuberances in the debris cloud. This is rho HV. One associated with A, one associated with B, one associated with C, one associated with D. Spectrum width. Wide spectrum width with A, with B, with C, and with D. So we can unambiguously identify each suction vortex. If a tree falls in the forest and nobody sees it, the, the um, National Weather Service classified this tornado as an EF3 tornado based on damage surveys. Many people went out and did damage surveys. Uh, and this is the rare area where the wind speeds that we recorded were their maximum. We were getting 130 meter per second wind speeds. <coughs> Look at all the, uh, the houses were either totally blown away or there was no damage. So you have to have damage markers to measure damage. Uh, in the wheat field, there were one meter swaths of flattened wheat. Well, our radar can't see one meter. <laughs> Undoubtedly, there were some very high wind speeds just by looking at this flattened wheat pattern. Uh, and there's a piece of farm equipment that had been tossed. Uh, there's no question that from our radar data, and Josh Werman was nearby, we both saw wind speeds well over 100 meters per second. There was no question that this was an EF5 tornado. And our wind measurements were made sometimes, uh, were made right within 10 meters of the ground because we were up in a high spot looking down. And part of the beam was in the lowest 10 meters. Now, of course, some of it's going to be weighted by wind speeds above that. Uh, if you want to compare damage estimates with mobile Doppler radars, you have a lot of difficulty. Remember that you have to worry about the time duration of your measurement, your averaging time interval. If you measure uh, wind speed Average it for 10 seconds, which is what you need to do to get the EF scale. Well, the Doppler radar doesn't measure winds for 10 seconds. It measures the winds a microsecond. However, if you look at scans every couple of seconds and average them, you can get it at a 10 second average. Uh, and what we find, of course, is that the wind speeds are lower. But they were still well above 100 meters per second. They weren't 130. They were more like 110, 120. The other issue is the volume that you're looking at. Uh, the radar has a fairly broad volume, uh, depending upon how far away you are. Uh, our pulse length was 30 meters. Uh, in azimuth, it may have been as much as 100 meters. So you're looking at a fairly large volume. So there could have been higher wind speeds at smaller, smaller regions. And uh, the radar weights by mass. So if you have a, a large piece of debris in your volume, it may be moving more slowly than a smaller piece of debris. And so, in that case, the wind speeds are going to be less. So there are factors which would make a, do a mobile Doppler radar indicate wind speeds that are higher and also lower. It's complicated. Uh, if you could animate this, please. This is uh, a broad view, and the cyclonic tornado is here. And go back and do that again, and you'll see the anti-cyclonic tornado wrapping up off to our southwest. Uh, here, here is the uh, debris signature. Before you uh, animate this, note that the debris cloud is four kilometers wide for the old cyclonic tornado, and there's a debris cloud for the anti-cyclonic tornado. If you could animate that, please. And animate it again. You can see the uh, anti-cyclonic tornado debris cloud is a spiral pattern spinning the other way, anti-cyclonically. And this is just a broad view showing the cyclonic vortex signature with the old cyclonic tornado and the anti-cyclonic vortex signature with the anti-cyclonic tornado. The anti-cyclonic tornado, as it always is when we see one, is a complete surprise. We're looking at the cyclonic tornado and all of a sudden uh, one of my students said, how we look at that debris and funnel off to our, south, uh, our southwest? And there it was. And there's a close-up of the anticyclonic tornado. Anticyclonic swirl in reflectivity. Anticyclonic vortex signature. 
the wind speeds vary from plus 30 meters to minus 50 meters per second. So we have a delta V of 80 meters per second over a distance of 500 meters. And there's the debris, uh, debris signature. And that's what it looked like just as it was ending. There's the funnel aloft and debris in the ground. And again, this picture, I'm sorry, it does not reproduce very well. We kept chasing the storm, 2353, uh, and there's the uh, uh, hook echo and donut hole as it's approaching Oklahoma City Airport. Uh, apparently, there was a fun day at, at Will Rogers Airport that day. And this is just a few kilometers away from us to our southwest. There's the vortex signature but we didn't really chase it. Then we uh, got into Oklahoma City and we decided that the chase was probably pretty much over. Maybe we should go east just a little bit to keep up with the storm. And we got off I-40 onto the I-240 and there you can see it was just a mammoth traffic jam. Actually, it doesn't look that bad there. There's our radar. We put it off and there's the tail cloud and the action, of course, is right back in there. And I'm thinking, Good heavens, if this thing puts out a big tornado that's coming right towards us, where are we going to go? And the first thing I did was I thought, just in case something happens and we can't move because of a traffic jam, what are we going to do for safety? And I found a, 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 a ran up a hill, and reconnoitered, and I decided that we may have to just get down and lay low there in case we couldn't get out of the way. Fortunately, uh, an emergency manager came by with flashing lights, saw, saw us, realized that we needed, wanted to get out of the way, and gave us a, an ambulance-like escort. We were going and driving on the shoulder and coming in, darting in and out of traffic until we got the next uh, road south uh, to get back to Norman. And that's what the storm looked like at this point. And we're here looking to the northwest. And it really had a very, very broad rotation. I mean, from there to there is uh, several kilometers. It's a very, very broad but intense mesocyclone. And then, uh, as we were heading for Norman, just east of Norman, trying to get back to Norman, there was the hook to our, it got to our south, to our uh, southwest, and we were very carefully watching the radar to make sure we weren't going to drive into a tornado. And we got back to Norman, and of course there was no power no power in Norman, and it was quite a night. And I did not know at that time that uh, uh, of any of the any of the mishaps that had happened that afternoon. Didn't find out about them till the next morning. But we collected a great data set. Now I'm, uh, I still have 25 minutes left, I guess, uh, in my hour. Let me just show you a little bit of data that we've collected in the last few years. This is from March 11th, March 18th, Southwest Oklahoma, and there's a little funnel didn't do very much, but then uh, it uh, began to approach us, had a nice appearance to it, and we were looking to the northeast, expecting maybe to see a tornado. This is in southwestern Oklahoma. And let me <coughs> loop uh, this if you can animate it. And what you can see, of course, is that we have a cyclonic wrap-up surrounded by precipitation to our northwest. But look to the southern part of this. You see a piece of the reflectivity that actually wraps up anticyclonically along that end. So we're sitting there looking to the northeast, expecting to see a tornado. And I'll get it. No, I won't. <laughs> OK. And here to our southwest, a tornado appeared. And I'm scratching my head, as I have done in past situations like this, what is a tornado doing southwest of us? I don't see anything on, on radar. Uh, the cyclonic uh, rotation is all to our northeast. And after we got home, we looked at the uh, data, and there's the cyclonic wrap-up with the cyclonic vortex signature with that mesocyclone. But if you come back around like this, there's a rear flank gust front, and on the southern edge of the rear flank gust front, we have some strong anticyclonic shear, and that's associated with the anticyclonic tornado. I've seen this a number of times, and it always fools me. I mean, 
when there's a big major cyclone in Walclap off to your northeast, you don't want to look southwest. But you probably should be looking southwest every once in a while. April 14th, 2012, the radar wasn't working. And so we just went out and chased for the fun of it. Uh, we had a, a bad ball bearing. But as luck would have it, we saw nine tornadoes. <laughs> and I just wished that we had had our radar working on, on this day. And at one point, actually two, two different times and locations, we had two tornadoes at once. That would have made a nice day to set. And then, on April 12th, Norman got hit. Where were we? Well, we weren't in Norman, and let's just not say anything more about that. <laughs> uh, the tornado uh, came straight through the center of Norman, and fortunately, it was a relatively weak tornado. It cut right across Main Street, about uh, two miles from, from my house, and that's some of the worst damage that it did, but most of the other damage that it did was a lot more minor. May 25, 2012, up by Russell, Kansas, and uh, this is at 031 UTC, and we're looking to the northwest. We're just, I think we're just east of Russell at this point, and there is what, whoops, there was a funnel cloud, and looked at the radar, and this is what we saw. We have a beautiful hook echo, and virtually everyone was focused on this hook echo. Our chasers were focused on that hook echo. And yet, way, way back, Hidden to the northwest, there was another hook with a very strong vortex signature. I don't think this actually became a tornado, but you have to be very, very careful to, to look out for these other tornadoes that are wrapped well behind the cool air at the surface. This is all. I, I've been chasing for decades, and it always fools me. I always need to look way, way in back, even when there's cold air. Uh, later on that evening, we then dropped that storm and picked up the storm to the southwest, which formed a beautiful tornado at sunset, which many of you were probably out there for. Let me just show you the animation of it. We cut the whole genesis of this storm. Animated. Okay, I'm going to show this several times. Just keep going. You see the wrap-up, the cyclonic wrap-up with an eye. I'll show it again as that, that tornado moves off to the northwest. And you can also see a anti strong anticyclonic rotation at the southern end of that appendage. There was not a, an anticyclonic tornado in this case, yet we're seeing the same thing. The anticyclonic uh, 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 vortex, the anticyclonic uh, rotation at the southern end of that line segment. And this is what the tornado looked like in, in its row stage. Uh, I, think, I don't know, many of you were probably there, but it was rather spectacular. And this is what it looked like on radar during this rope stage. You notice how the vortex signature is elongated. It's strung out. So we're actually seeing, in one scan, we're seeing part of the rotation coming toward the radar and then cross over to the rotation going away from the radar. So this is a nice horizontal tornado. And uh, Jeff Schneider took these pictures at night of the next tornado going on to the north of us. And this was the one that I believe that one of the Dows drove through. We were south of it looking north. There's the uh, tornado. Jeff does a great job taking pictures at night. I can't even see these things with my eyes. But if you could go ahead and uh, show this animation, please. And watch the cyclonic tornado form there. And there's the eye propagating due north. Again, it wraps up. There's the eye moving north, northeast. Now, the southern end is going to rotate anticyclonically. Let's go back and show that again. Look at the anticyclonic rotation on the southern end, but no anticyclonic tornado in this particular case. Important scientific questions, of course, are why is it that sometimes these produce anticyclonic tornadoes and other times they don't? Two vortices. This was the tornado. Another cyclonic vortex formed in the southwest of it, but never was reported as a tornado. Of course, it was night. I don't think the wind speeds were strong enough to do any damage. And then later on that night, there was another tornado off to our west, but it was a little bit far away and in the dark. We didn't want to play with it. 
May 29, 2012, this is just uh, near uh, uh, south of uh, Piedmont, Oklahoma. Um, and this is at 12 degree elevation angle. We have a whole string of cyclonic vortices along, along the flanking line. And this is a wide angle shot that took of the storm just prior to the formation of the tornado. And uh, rather spectacular. As you can see, sunlight shining through here, some precipitation falling, and there's the wall cloud. And then, boom, uh, there was the tornado. It was mostly embedded in, in precipitation, not a strong tornado. But we did catch it. Uh, just make sure I didn't miss it. Okay. And there's the tornado. Again, the eye. Nothing in ZDR. Nothing, a little tiny thing in row HV. And there's the uh, vortex couplet seen by the, the uh, Doppler. And if you could animate this, please. We, again, we cut the whole life cycle of this. And there you see the tor this tornado form. Again, please. It's wrapped in precip. And it dissipates. Move to the north, northeast. And then a lot of precipitation falls out around it. This is a classic HP, HP supercell. Okay, we're well moving on to uh, 2013, other storms. Uh, this is what we call the Edmund Carney storm. Would you refer to this as something else, I think? Bethel, Bethel whatever. It's the same, what's in the name? Okay, a rose is a rose, a storm is a storm. It's, it's that one. And we're looking to the northwest. There's the tornado and the wall cloud and tail cloud. And we cut the whole life cycle of this. Also, let me show you some of our deployment locations. Uh, our deployment spot here was just north of I-44, and so we were able to see uh, the genesis and a good part of this tornado. KTLX is down here, so we're going to be able to do some dual Doppler analysis uh, showing the formation of this tornado. This is future work to come. And here's the animation of this, uh, this uh, star. If you could animate it, please. And you can see the tornado. You can't tell the tornado is forming. It always looks as if there is one. There's a hook. But it, it, you got the tornado really is forming. Just because you have a hook in a donut hole doesn't mean you have a tornado. It means you have a vortex. It just may not be strong enough to be called a tornado. Now, we then, uh, at that point, we had a little disagreement in the chase truck. One of my students wanted to go with the tornado that was there. Follow the tornado. And I said, absolutely not. Yeah, the tornado's moving into an area where there are a lot of trees. We caught the formation of the tornado. Let's drop south and get the next storm. And so uh, we did. And we set up first at location three. And we caught the beginning of the storm. And uh, we collected some data. Then uh, I got a little bit scared. And when the tornado came within nine kilometers, we dropped south because we knew we would have to uh, need a time to reset up the, the radar and collect data. We dropped to position four, and we had a very short deployment at four. Uh, the tornado came so close we could see condensation in the trees across the street. I did not like that, and we collected data for a short time. It turned out that the tornado was actually several kilometers away. Your your distance really can, can fool, your sense of distance can really fool you. And then we went uh, southeast and position five, uh, I'll show you what we saw there. Uh, I think that the significant damage occurred right over here while we were moving south. And uh, this is a video that I shot from the location in which we're north of the tornado as it's developing, looking to the southwest. I must tell you, it was painful trying to be safe, and also get a place where we could actually see what was happening. Oklahoma has a lot of trees in central Oklahoma. Very difficult to find a suitable spot. And uh, uh, the lake is off to our southwest, so we have better visibility. So I shot this from the window while we were, uh, while we were collecting data. So if you click on this, please. Sound? Here's a suction vortex.
got to be getting great data now. It wasn't possible to set up a tripod. It was raining. It's going to be late by the end of the day. And then we're going to leave. The rainy air. Oh my god. Okay, we've got to go. I'm sorry. Uh, I think it's not safe anymore. We've got to go. Shut it down. You get a multiple vortex tornado. It's a shame to have to move when you're looking at this. That shaking is the radar track being unleveled. But we're still collecting data. We're going to hang in there as long as we possibly can. We got a chaser going by. Yeah, I, I think we ought to... Yeah, Jana, you're still collecting data? Uh, how far is it away? To how many? Okay, hang on just a little bit longer then. Keep collecting. No. Nine kilometers. That's why you have telephoto lenses. <laughs> so my decision to leave at nine kilometers was uh, keep clicking that. Is that, is that not, okay? Anyway, here's the animation. <coughs> Go back. Keep, click in the animation. Coming right towards us. You can see why I, I got a little spooked. Okay, at nine kilometers, we get out of the way. Okay. So, then we travel to the south, looking to the west, this is what I'm looking at. And at this point, I'm seeing what look like three, three tornadoes in one. One main tornado and a couple of satellite tornadoes. And again, you don't get to see this very often, they're mostly trees. <laughs> very, very dis difficult. This is what some of the radar data, uh, and there you see the vortex couplet. There's a debris cloud, the Rho HV. You can see that the closest is about two kilometers. Three kilometers from the center, that's the ZDR, uh, and that's the debris ball uh, from just uh, several kilometers away. And there's another uh, image, and again, there's the, the central ring. Here we have two, or two speed maxima. We're seeing this a lot. We're actually somehow, very often, we're seeing two vortices, two associated with the mesocyclone and then the tornado. We're actually able to separate out, we think. <laughs> the tornado from the mesocyclone. So if you ask, is, is the tornado, the mesocyclone, contracted to a small scale? In some instances, that's hard to see. It looks as if the mesocyclone is still there and, and distinct. Now, we moved, went on to the next uh, location, south, and there's the tornado, the eye of the tornado, and there's the vortex couplet. Meanwhile, off to our northeast, we're getting, we are truly getting cyclical mesocyclogenesis and a new hook formed, uh, but it never actually became a tornado. At that point, the chase was over because the roads were clogged. We couldn't move. We had to turn around. The Moore tornado. We were one of the many chasers that were not in Moore. We were south of Moore. We were in the storms in southwestern Oklahoma. And yet, from our vantage point, which was on a high in a hill, there's the genesis of the Moore tornado, seen by a rack's pole, six degree elevation angle. There's the hole, there's ZDR, there's the vortex signature. That's in excess of 80 meters per second already. This is in 1939, and a little debris signature, Rho HV. So we were, even from that distance, we were able to see the, the beginning of the Moore tornado. And uh, the, I went and uh, looked at the damage, and uh, Greg showed some pictures. It, if, if you've never seen this before, it's just mind-boggling. These are panoramic pictures. Both of these are 180 degrees, and it's, it, to see the damage is just staggering. And I got to fly up in a helicopter 
thanks to PBS and the Discovery Channel. And that was pretty exciting. This is more. And look at the one, two, three, four, five, six plucks of almost complete devastation. The tornado was moving from, from, from right to left. It, it just boggles the mind. And uh, some of the pictures I just showed you were from the ground in here. This is where the maximum damage was done. Now, I can't do this here, but you can zoom in. These are pretty high resolution images. And you get to a place where you see houses on one side of the street virtually untouched, and houses on the other side of the street gone. And that is absolutely shocking. I mean, to see a house gone is shocking, but to see how, what short distance, this was not due to multiple vortices. This was due to the velocity gradients in the, in the tornado. Really amazing. Uh, another thing that caught my eye, this was a north-south road. And notice how all the trees are lining towards the north. Okay. Not much sign of any rotation. The highest wind speeds were flowing into the tornado this particular point. So what does it mean when you look at a Doppler vortex signature and see high wind speeds? You're probably not seeing the highest wind speeds. You're surely not seeing what's happening at the ground. And I'm not showing this, but we also flew around the other side, and the trees were also pointing into the, uh, into the tornado. And there are some, uh, some people that happened to catch each other. You, you bump into, we bumped into each other at a, at a truck stop, Reed and Jim Cantori and I, and then we all went our separate ways <laughs> on this day. And uh, this is what happened later on that day. This is May 28th in southwestern Oklahoma. And uh, we had gone into Texas, followed storms for hours and hours, and nothing very interesting was happening. And then all of a sudden, 6 o'clock magic, what can I say, it happens, and um, just at our location, the storm kicked up, and uh, this hill storm that fell is three inches along its major axis. Luckily, we didn't get any damage to the radar, but then came the surprise. Now, before you animate this, we're sitting here, all right? <laughs> and I'm not, this is, this is an important lesson to learn. I'm not seeing a wall cloud. I see no indications that there's going to be a tornado. I'm cursing. I'm doing something Chuck Doswell often does. Bad mouthing the storm. It's not going to produce. This looks terrible. And watch what happens if you can animate this. I mean, talk about luck. And uh, that certainly looks like a tornado. It smells like a tornado. Uh, there was only a minimal funnel and a little bit of dust got kicked up at the ground. This was about as marginal as a tornado gets. Yet, when you look at the Doppler radar images, you say, well, this looks like a tornado. There's a hook and it wraps up and produces an eye. This was very, very weak, very marginal. And just the still, there's the eye. There's the, look how small that vortex couplet is, red to green. No debris signature whatsoever. No debris signature. The winds were strong enough to classify it as a weak tornado, but it, it made it into the storm data as a tornado. Uh, May 30th, I'm going to hurry up here. Looking to the northwest, tail cloud, wall cloud, HP supercell. And this is a panoramic shot that I took. We were all watching this particular wall cloud. And I didn't notice this until I looked at my photographs one day. I said, what's this? And I blew it up. There's a funnel cloud. <laughs> and this was not a tornado. Uh, this is our radar data from that time. We're looking at the hook, hoping to see something form. But off to the west, there's another storm. And there was a vortex couplet, a cyclonic vortex couplet, located right in there. So. And just animate this very quickly. Whoops. Just animate that if you can. Looks very nice. You see uh, cloud material feed in from the forward flank. No tornado. High precipitation storm. This is what happens when you get very close to a hook. We're about a, a kilometer and a half from a hook. And here I'm saying I'm not scared. 
We don't see any, we see very, very weak rotation. And yet, no tornado, weak rotation, no damage. When you look at that, you say to yourself, my God, how can there not be a tornado? There's a beautiful hook. Um, but there's the Doppler velocity, just weak shear, no debris signature. So just because you see a hook echo, doesn't mean you have a tornado, or even close to having a tornado. So, uh, uh, future improvements for Raxpol and other future research, I'll let you read that. Um, we hope to have the Doppler LiDAR working it out again this year. We used it in 2010. Uh, Roger Wakimoto and Nolan Atkins will be doing photogrammetric analyses. My graduate students, Zach Weinhoff and Kyle Keane, are going to be um, analyzing the data from uh, the tornadoes from last year. Next slide. I can do that. <laughs> I gotta shamelessly plug my, my latest book uh, that came out last June that's had virtually no advertisement whatsoever, so I'll let you know about it. And it's ridiculously expensive, which is not my fault. Uh, it's a graduate level textbook. There are a lot of equations, but half the book consists of photographs and radar images, uh, Delta radar images, in case you're interested. And now before I finish, I would like to show you a couple of videos um, that I was not able to put in the PowerPoint because they're in MPS format. And these are totally unrelated to storm chasing. And excuse me just a second, I'll get out and get into the... I'm going to first show you... Um, let me tell the story before you show that. I like to chase storms as you do. I like to collect data. I like to take photographs. And then every once in a while, life has its little... Rewards. I mean, you drive hundreds and thousands of miles and don't get anything. I was at DIA, Denver International Airport, and I had come up to Boulder for the summer. I was there for a week, and I had to fly back to Norman because my graduate student, Jana Hauser, was defending her PhD thesis. And I didn't want to go back. <laughs> but I did. She's my student. I need to, I need to do this. It's important. I got to the airport, I was about to get in my southwest flight back to, back to Oklahoma City. A thunderstorm came up outside, and my first reaction was, oh, there's going to be lightning and thunder, they're going to shut the airport down because of lightning, and I'm going to be late. I pulled out my cell phone, I looked at the radar, tornado warning sitting right over the airport. And I, at, I immediately went to the radar, there's a vortex signature sitting over the airport. So, what did I do? I got out of my southwest line. I was queued up at that point. Looked out the window. Uh-oh, there's a foul cloud. And then, this is what happened. <coughs> <coughs> Ha, ha, ha.